Hi, everyone. In this episode, I'm talking with Sherry Smith. She and I have known each other since college, and we actually worked together for several years while we were coming up professionally. She always impressed me as one of the smartest people I know. She's done graduate work at Georgetown, worked for Hillary Clinton for a time, and she is now the CEO and founder of the Indigo Project, an education company that does extensive assessment and consulting work in the education space, both at the high school and college level. I wanted to have Sherry on for two reasons. One, because she's a longtime friend and I wanted to catch up with her, but two, because she has unique insight into the education space at large. And I think we all can agree that the education system needs change. I also think that the pandemic showed real cracks and faults in the education system much more clearly. Sherry and her company have a unique approach to working within the education system to help transform it from within. Her method is unique, her perspective is hopeful, and her approach may be just what we need to change the education system from the inside out. As kids and their parents are figuring out the new normal of education once again, this interview could not come at a better time. Now, for those of you who are in business or business leaders, or you've grown your children already, you might be tempted to click away at this point, thinking that this might not have anything to do with you. Quite the contrary, actually. Assessments like the ones we're about to discuss have relevance for everyone, not just students. So if you're looking to unlock performance, high performance from your team, this might be a compelling tool to consider regardless of whether you're running a small startup or a Fortune 500. Self-awareness is for everyone and it's everything. It's key to humility, to interpersonal relationships, effective leadership, growth, learning, and of course, top performance. This interview will give you insight into the future of work, both the future workforce and the kind of functions that are coming up now and in the next several years and decades. I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the LifeWorks Podcast. Joining me today is longtime friend and colleague, Sherry Smith. She is the CEO of the Indigo Project. And, and Sherry, it is an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for taking time with me today. Thank you, Mark. So we're going to talk a lot about assessments. And for the purpose of our audience, the word assessments means the body of different assessment instruments that are out there, such as Myers-Briggs, such as DISC, first analysis, Hogan, what have you. The word assessment is used in many contexts, but the, the project that you lead deals in assessments. And so I want to just define that up front. And your target audience is really in the education space. So you get to see a lot of students, teachers and administrators. And 2020 was a really different year for education all over the world. How did teachers, administrators, and students do? What was your observation of what was going on in the education system in 2020 and the early part of 2021? It was really a difficult year for everyone in education, from the parents to the kids, the teachers, and the administrators trying to move to a totally new way of teaching and learning while everyone's in crisis. So I would describe 2021 as a year of disruption and chaos, but I also like to think of it as bringing new innovation and hope to our system. So tell us a little bit about what the Indigo Project is. The Indigo Project is a self-awareness company. We really believe that the foundation of transformative teaching and learning is self-awareness. 
is knowing yourself, is being deeply known and seen, and then getting an education that's tailored to your strengths and your purpose in life. So we use um, for actually four assessments and a multi-measure tool with mostly high school students, and we help them have self-awareness, and then we help the educators that work with them really meet each student where they're at. So what was the problem that you were trying to solve when you founded the Indigo Project? What was that gap app that you were trying to fill? Two problems, really. One is that one-size-fits-all factory model education, we all know it doesn't work. And we've been trying to reform it for years and years and years. But instead of starting with the person, we try to change the structure. We try to change the rules. But we, in order to do that, you have to start with the people and who the people are. So that's one of the main problems. And then the secondary problem is corporate America is really struggling with people who don't love their jobs and disengagement. I mean, you know, these statistics, I mean, Gallup saying only one third of people are actually engaged in their jobs. And right now, after the pandemic, I think they're calling it the great resignation. Like 40% of people are looking for new jobs. And that has a lot to do with the education system and not teaching people who they are and what kind of job really fits them. So what you do is you use uh, assessment tools to help Mm -hmm. students, right? High school is your target market, right? That's your target audience. Mm -hmm. I've heard that, you know, the, the, the brain doesn't fully form until 25. Is it realistic to get a a, a good reading on a high school student knowing that they may have upwards of maybe a decade ahead of them before they're essentially fully formed. I'm curious to know, do we change fundamentally from the time, say we're 14 till we hit 25 or are we pretty much the same? Like most things in life, there's no black and white. There's no straightforward answer and everything's different. And we've done a lot of research with freshmen in high school taking the indigo assessment and seniors coming out. And it's quite interesting what we found. A third of them, like almost the exact same scores, like their skill scores and things like that have gone up, obviously. But as far as behaviors and motivators, because we measure strengths, behaviors, motivators, 21st century skills, and social emotional perception. So how they're feeling about themselves and the world around them, which is even more important these days. But most of the scores, a third of the kids, they're almost identical. About a third of the kids, they would have shifted drastically in one or more behavior or motivator. And then a third of the kids, they have quite different results. But the interesting thing, and this is the difference between a student who's been through the self-awareness process and a student who hasn't, is they can tell you exactly why. Like I saw a young woman who went from dead last aesthetic motivator, which is valuing beauty, harmony, artistic expression to number one and very passionate. And she said, oh yeah, when I took this, I always wanted to be an artist, but my parents always told me I couldn't be one. And my art teacher really encouraged me to start expressing my desires. And now it's something I'm really passionate about. So she knew exactly why, but she could articulate it because now she had a language to articulate her own journey and her own change, which I think is incredibly valuable for young people. Even if you do change, now you have a framework by which to understand in what ways you're changing and how to discuss it with others. Do you think that it's best to uh, administer it when they're younger and then when they're older so that you can get the comparison? Or do you think there's maybe a sweet spot where if you get them at, say, age 16 or 17, that you, yeah, you pretty much got them where where they're going to be? What's your thought about that? We think the ideal is having a benchmark every couple of years. So it would be great to, even if you could get a baseline in middle school, and then ninth, 10th grade, and then 11th, 12th grade, then you really can see the progression. We think that's best. Every year seems like overkill and the kids are already over-tested, even though this isn't a test, there's no high stakes on it. It's really right. important that right. there can't be a rate profile. That would be dystopian. Right. That would be the same issue we have now. But, but we feel like every other year gives them time to grow and change. And it also, it's not too repetitive. Do you do any work with adults at all or young adults? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we work with several universities, actually over 20 of them. And we work a lot with the educators themselves. So we will work with superintendents and their cabinets. We'll do team building within schools. And that's something very different about Indigo than other companies that are working with student self-development is we tend to work with everyone in the building because self-awareness is for everyone. It's not just for when you're 15. I mean, we're in our 40s and we're still... 
growing and learning. It's, it's a lifetime process. What kind of output does the Indigo assessments offer? What kind of data does it offer? DISC is our behavioral science, and a lot of corporate folks have taken DISC and know DISC really well. We have a motivational science that's by Dr. Edward Spranger, also pretty common in the corporate space. The strength science is actually a combination of behaviors and motivators. The 21st century skills is proprietary to our technology partner, Target Training International, PTI. They're out of Scottsdale, Arizona. And then we use the Hartman Value Profile, which is created by Dr. Robert S. Hartman, and he was nominated for the Nobel Prize. And his science is incredibly powerful, founded in axiology for the social-emotional learning. So that takes 45 minutes. It's all online. They usually take it in a class period. And then you get a 16 to 20 page report that just has lots of printouts about you. So if someone wants to see what that looks like, you could actually go to our website, indigoeducationcompany.com, and you can download a sample report, which is my report. You can read all about me. What are the benefits of doing something like the Indigo assessment? So the obvious benefits are self-awareness. Another huge benefit is interpersonal skills. So Realizing that not everybody communicates the same way, not everyone behaves the same way. It takes a lot of those behaviors, like, for example, a lot of times extroverted folks misinterpret introverts, think, oh, that person doesn't like me, that person's mean, that person's shy, and really understanding, oh, no, that's just that person's style, and that's what makes them unique and gifted. So I think interpersonal skills, communication skills, greater empathy and a deeper understanding of what drives me and how do I conserve my precious energy and my life force. Do you see any correlation between student performance and them having taken this assessment? The system, like the education system itself, definitely favors high compliance and high theoretical students. So students behaviorally who will do what they're told and will follow rules. And so Every school we've ever done, they, as a whole, the entire group, adults and students, adapt compliance up. So it is a compliance culture. And theoretical is learning for the sake of learning. So education has this belief that you should just want to learn because learning is great. But not everybody has that value. That's one of the values we measure. And so students who are low in that value tend to actually perform worse in school because they don't see the connection between school and the real world. As far as students' performance going up, it's very difficult because the system is so tied to a certain way of being and delivering certain variables that just knowing yourself doesn't necessarily make it better. In some ways, it might make it worse because once you know yourself, you're even like less likely to want to play the game. We have had experiences with kids who are failing every single subject, and once they felt seen and known for who they actually were, they started performing and passing every single subject. So it's a really interesting combo. And like everything with Indigo and in my life, it's very circumstantial, depending on the other circumstances in the student's life. How did you get involved in this field? I started doing assessments in my early 20s when I was working for a national sales director, and he was having a hard time keeping salespeople is a very complicated way of selling. And he was losing about 80% of his sales folks. They just wouldn't make it. And then using assessment technology, we we're able to flip that statistic and he was able to retain 80% of his sales folks. And so that kind of opened my eyes to what you could do with assessments. Also was personally really eye-opening for me. I had taken Myers-Briggs when I was in 10th grade and I loved it. And I've been using them ever since, all different kinds of assessments. So what's the most fulfilling aspect of what you do? I love to connect with people and I love to see people. I always pray that I can see people the way God sees them. And I definitely know from assessments that there is no two people alike and people are incredibly varied. And I love that about the diversity of humanity. So how would Indigo have helped you when you were growing up? As I said before, the Myers-Briggs, just knowing that there were types and I wasn't a weirdo and, and it just made my life make more sense to me. And knowing, for example, like I'm an intuitive on the Myers-Briggs and my family's all sensors. And I just 
could never relate to them and they really never got me. And so that really helped me already. And having more data, like the Indigo that has way more information than Myers-Briggs would have just been a bonanza. This totally blew my mind, really. Let's turn the clock forward then 10 years. What change are you hoping to see in the education system as a result of the work that you're doing? So I have a pretty radical view of education. I actually believe in a hundred percent choice. Absolutely. We need some basics, like kids need to be able to read. And honestly, there's a lot of kids that can't read coming out of the system, which is very upsetting to me. So beyond the basics, I actually think that there should be almost unlimited choices for kids. So if they want to do the more liberal arts kind of approach and learn lots of different subjects, they can, if they want to be an entrepreneur in high school and learn their math, doing their accounting and learn about sociology, selling to people and learn about history, trying to understand doing product research. Like to me, having an entrepreneur school, having an art school, having a country where there actually is total freedom and choice for students where they can pursue their gifts and learn in a way that is unencumbered by this idea that everyone has to fit through a certain mold. And I do feel like we're heading in that direction and jobs are heading in that direction. I'd love to see it happen in 10 years. It would be amazing. Maybe it will happen in 50. So right now, what are those skills of the future that you're preparing students for? So there is a big skill that I like to call integrative ability. And we actually measure this. It's one of the Hartman data points. So it's the ability to take lots of disparate information and integrate it into something new. So it's a really complex way of solving problems. It's a way of critical thinking with this whole like Twitter, Snapchat society where we're taking just like little tiny bits of information and like making up whole storylines. We need to move away from that and move into gathering disparate information from different voices and different sources and putting that together to accomplish a goal with many different folks from many different perspectives. And that's the only way we're going to solve some of these huge issues that we're facing as the world. I love what you just said, because I think it's something that is so sorely lacking right now in our society, where it's extraordinarily polarized one direction or the other, and there's no meeting in the middle. And and, and I think, as you said brilliantly, there isn't this sort of integration of multiple perspectives because it's very easy for one to say, I'm liberal and and this is what I believe and this is why it's right. Or I'm a conservative and this is why that's right. As opposed to being able to take the value of those various perspectives, putting them together, I think we'd get better solutions that way if we all had that level of critical thinking, that skill to be able to integrate multiple pieces of of information. No, I think that's beautiful what you just said. So thank you for that. What are some of the kinds of jobs of the future that you see either now or in the next, say, five to 10 years? I really believe that a lot of people are going to be creating their own jobs. And so much so that we, during the pandemic, we actually launched a free version so people can just get a taste. Anybody in the whole world is at indigopathway.com. And every single person who takes this seven minute quiz gets design your own job as one of their options. And because we really believe that a lot of the jobs of the future, it's going to be the gig economy. There's going to be a lot of jobs that don't exist right now. If we can get universal basic income, which is something my husband's really working on, he'd be a good podcasty person for you. Then people will also have the fun to explore new things and As we increase technology and production, a lot of these cookie cutter jobs just really don't make sense. And I'm actually not even a believer in cookie cutter jobs. The idea that like every ER nurse has the same job doesn't really make sense. What if this ER nurse was like really good at handling people under stress and this ER nurse did the meditations, right? So this whole idea of cookie cutter anything is really disappearing in our society because anything cookie cutter can be automated. And the jobs of the future don't exist yet. We'll be inventing them ourselves. So I want to do something called speed round. And I'm going to give you a word. And you tell me the first word or phrase that comes to mind. And if you want to offer a little bit of explanation, you can if you want to. 
uh, or I may ask for some elaboration on your answer. All right. Ready? Netflix. Movies. Movies. <laughs> COVID-19. Change. Change. Pfizer. Miracle. Bitcoin. Interesting. Apple. Brilliant. Tesla. A mixed bag. <laughs> Why would you say that? Just curious. I think it's good that they're moving forward with new technologies and electricity and things like that. But I also think that it's not accessible to the average person. And I'm all about like the bottom, making things accessible to all people in society. Elon Musk. Visionary. Another one. Steve Jobs. Well, in indigo terms, he was a DC. He was both dominant and compliant, which is a, a difficult combo to be. That's very interesting. I, I can see him as dominant. Absolutely. But compliant, really? Compliant to his own rules and his own ideals. Ah, okay. That, that I very I, intense about what was correct in his world. I had a guest who described him as maniacal. So I, I could see that. Yeah, maniac, maniacally compliant to his own rules and his way. Yes, I could see it. And you had to be maniacally compliant as well. Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea. That is a stab. That makes me sad. Amazon. Amazon. Ah, world domination. Indeed. Uh, okay, good. Disney. Disney. Beauty and the Beast. One of my favorite movies. You have good taste, Sherry. <laughs> and finally, Sherry Smith. Sherry Smith, just a journeyer or a spiritual entrepreneur. I'm actually writing a book on spiritual entrepreneurship nice. because I feel like that's a new thing of the future. And I'm part of that. If you could offer one ingredient of your secret sauce, what would that be? I think the one ingredient is just empathy just to try to feel what someone's feeling and to not know to have empathy and not know the answer what's the greatest lesson you've learned either in life or in business that everyone has a story and the story matters and if you can offer one piece of advice to the world what would it be this is going to sound quite cliche but to just fill your heart with love and project it wherever you go so you get a chance to meet your 100-year-old self. What does she say to you? She says to just keep going. It's going to be like Dory and Finding Nemo. Let's talk to your 14-year-old self. What would your 14-year-old self say to you today? Would she be proud of you? What would she say? Yeah, I think my 14-year-old self would be proud of me. And I think she'd be surprised by a lot of the things that happened in our lives. And I think she'd be excited about all that's going to happen and grateful. What do you want most for your life? I, I actually want to do what I feel like is my purpose and I want to do God's will. And I don't know exactly what that is, but I'm trying every day to do the best I can. So I've asked you a lot of questions. Are there any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Just that I believe that the world's actually getting better. I think a lot of people feel like the world's gone to hell in a handbasket and is really discouraged. But I believe that the world is getting better and we're evolving as a species. And there's a lot of young people out there who really care. I see them every day who are trying and don't buy into the new system. And I'm really excited about the youth that are coming in. And if we can just open their eyes to who they really are. They will solve a lot of these problems. It's a beautiful message that needs to be heard so badly today. Thank you for sharing that. And I think that's a great way to, to end our time together. Where can people find you and connect with you and Indigo online? We have two websites. One is just indigoeducationcompany.com. And if you write in the contact list, my folks will make sure it gets to me. Indigo pathway.com is the, the free assessment we have out there. Fantastic. Sherry, it has been, as always, just an incredible pleasure to talk with you and reconnect after so long. For my audience members, Sherry and I go back many, many, many years. It's, so it's somewhere between 10 and 20, but which means that when we met, we were about <laughs> two years old. 
So, <laughs> so Sherry, what a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything you shared uh, today. Can't wait to share this with my audience. Thank you, Mark. Really appreciate it. It was great reconnecting with you. Hey guys, thanks for watching and listening. Hit the subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode. And check out some of these other clips from the podcast.